Hi, I'm Susan Colley and welcome to You're Not Alone Surviving Your Child's Disability. Respite care is critical for parents of children with disabilities. Not only does respite care provide a much needed break from the constant responsibility, stress and concern, but it also allows parents to spend some quality time with other members of the family. Here to talk about the import this important subject is Joan Kelly Rafferty, project coordinator from the Massachusetts Lifespan Respite Coalition, and Amy Nazir, project director from L MLRC and director of family support and children's services at the Department of Developmental Services, Northeast Region. Hi. Hi. How are you? Great. <laughs> nice Good. To be here. Nice, to, nice be here. to have you here. What does the Massachusetts Lifespan Respite Coalition do to promote quality respite care for individuals with disabilities? Would either one of you, you like to, to answer maybe that? A little bit about our history and sure. So we've been around for about three years, mm -hmm. and we started as a result of a federal grant that we received from the Federal Administration on Community Living. And really the focus of the grant is to look at respite care as a short break in caregiving responsibilities and that's something that's a critical need for all families of anybody, oh, yes. of any caring for anyone with any type of special need regardless mm -hmm. of age or disability, just looking at it very broadly that anyone who's caring for a loved one with special needs needs a break. Oh, and definitely. so that's really the overall goal of our group and what we've been working on. And Great. we've approached that through a lot of different ways, which we'll talk about. Okay. Did you want to add anything with that, Joan? Uh, just that we really are looking at a number of different things to help families find out information, resources, support, um, between having conferences, um, information on our website, directing people to different locations, whether it's web-based or in the community, that they might be able to get information and help. At this point, like our ideal dream would be that someday we had funding and we could actually provide respite funding to families. Um, but that would be a very long-term goal of ours. It's sort of on our radar, but not something that we can really address right now. Funding is a right very now. important issue as well. It's a huge issue. Um, you know, because parents can't afford uh, to spend the cost for respite care. What is the going rate now these days? I think it really varies and depends on the need of your care recipient. So if you have maybe um, a, an adult or a child that it can walk independently, communicate, function pretty well in the community, you might be able to hire someone for about $12 an hour. Mm -hmm. If you're someone who has, whose individual might be in a wheelchair, maybe has um, a feeding tube, a seizure disorder, maybe some other medical complexities, you're really talking about hiring someone that has maybe more medical training. You may, in some cases, families may even need a nurse, which mm -hmm. is a lot more money per hour and, and then it varies between finding someone independently or if you're working through an agency, agencies have rates. There's a lot more scrutiny and other things that go along with working with an agency, but it really mm -hmm. ranges broadly. And just to add to that in terms of the, the funding piece, one of the things that we are doing with our website, um, which again, we'll talk about that as we go along, massrespite.org mm -hmm. is the website that we've developed is helping families get some information about, you know, maybe there are some sources of funding that you might be eligible for to help offset the cost. So families don't have to feel like they have to pay for all of this out of their own pocket. Yeah. So we're hoping, and as Joan said, it's kind of our, our goal over as we continue to develop the website is to really help families figure out, okay, maybe I'm eligible for some funding from the Department of Developmental Services or mm -hmm. Mass Health or different funding sources depending on the needs of your loved one so that we can help kind of Do you have a hotline or anything of that nature um, that you've developed or anything so that parents can ca call in and ask questions? Right. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that really, um, again, ideally, we would love to be able to offer something like that. There just isn't any funding uh, to support a hotline. Mm -hmm. um, we are trying to work with some other community agencies that are already in place that do that kind of work um, that, and we're hoping to collaborate further with them like Mass211 um, that actually has a good respite listing on there. I went on there to kind of see what resources they might have and I was surprised at how much they did have. Huh. And they, they do have a call center there so we're hoping to work with them to get some information to them that they can maybe pass on if families call, decide to call there. Um, 
but at this point we really don't have a hotline um, and one of our goals is really to just help people network um, be able to direct people maybe to the right agency or person that could help them right. with a phone call, but we right, right now don't have that capability. Yeah, um, we're that would be, as, as yeah. you said, it would be ideal because parents have all sorts of questions yeah. about right. where to go and how to do it and all of that because right. they get frustrated when they can't find anything. Right. right. I think we've also been really um, tuned into the fact that Family caregivers don't have a lot of time to be online. I mean, just an example, I was trying to book an airline flight, and you can be on for an hour before mm -hmm. you get the right one, where you're going. Parents don't have that kind of time to find respite. No. So when they go on a website, they want to be able to navigate it easily mm -hmm. and spend a short amount of time and get the information they need from it and move on. So we're really cognizant of that fact, and we're really trying to make our website very user-friendly. Do um, you think that um, people, the audience out there, knows a lot about uh, Mass Lifespan Respite Coalition because I personally have never heard about it till recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I, I think, you know, a little PR is in order. Yep. Mm -hmm. and that's, you're right on track with that and that's actually one of the things that we're really focusing on. We haven't been around that long, so it's not surprising that you haven't heard about us until recently. Um, but we're trying very hard, and that's one of the real, you know, major goals of our group, the, mm -hmm. the MLRC, Massachusetts Lifespan Respite Coalition, is to um, increase our outreach and really get people to know that we're out there. Um, one thing we did last year, which we, um, I think, went a long way towards um, getting our name out there, is we co-hosted the National Lifespan Respite Conference along with the National Great. Respite Coalition. So that happened last October. And you had a really good turnout. In Boston at the Park Plaza Hotel. So oh, okay. that was, you know, we were asked to do that by the National Coalition and felt like we, we couldn't say no. We had to take that opportunity right. for exactly that reason. And things right. like that, just, you know, we're going to look at any opportunities that we can to really increase our visibility. Okay. And so if okay. I could just add a little bit too, I mean, our coalition is, is as Amy said, just three years old. Um, I'm the only paid um, staff person um, on the coalition, and I just went from 20 hours to 40. Wow. So it's really been, we've been on a very much of a shoestring. Amy does one day in kind um, through her job at the Department of Developmental Services, mm -hmm. and then we have everyone else as a volunteer. And wow. we maybe have about 30 active members that come to all the meetings or on committees. We have a, a membership of about 450 on our email list, um, but really it's been a handful of people that have really brought this together and done, you know, so we do, we have a lot of initiatives, like NPR is one of the big ones that we really yep. need to work on. Mm -hmm. Now, to change the subject a little bit, how do you actually help parents find a provider for respite care? Well, there's a few ways that we could do that. So. And this has, as our name has gotten out there, this has started to happen more and more because if you Google respite in Massachusetts, our names come up. So on a pretty regular mm -hmm. basis, we'll get inquiries, either email or phone calls from people oh, who found great. our names. Mm -hmm. And so what we would do is first of all, find out from the person if they are eligible for an agency. Like mm -hmm. let's say their loved one you know, is eligible for services from the Department of Mental Health or the Department of Developmental Services, then the first thing we would do is direct them to their service coordinator or case manager at that agency. Mm -hmm. But I would always tell people if they don't feel like they're getting the answers or they're not satisfied with the information they're getting, let us know and we'll see if we can help point them in other directions too. So that's one thing. Another thing is if somebody has um, either the ability to to pay for some respite themselves, or mm -hmm. they happen to be eligible for Mass Health and right. PCA services, right. personal care attendant services, right. they can go to another website that we work with, which is rewardingwork.org, okay. which has an online listing of people um, who are interested in providing PCA, but they, they're they also open to um, Now that would be for people respite. that are more and more um, health involved. Yes, but not part. totally. There are a lot of um, kids with disabilities or kids with autism or behavioral issues 
that can be eligible for, for some PCA, PCA hours. Mm -hmm. PC, I should make it clear that PCA hours really aren't specifically designed for respite, but a lot of times the people who are on that registry mm -hmm. might also be willing to provide respite. And we're actually working with Rewarding Work to develop a page or a tab on their, their website which is specific oh, wow. to respite. So that would be great. That would be a way to get people connected mm -hmm. with individual workers. Well, they have a great, of yeah, they have a great search engine on their website. You can Do put they? in where you live. If you're looking for someone within 10 miles, you put when you're looking for someone. Mm -hmm. you, might, you can specify if you want someone who has experience with children, um, if um, they have experience maybe with behavior management. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the, so the, um, it's kind of like, it's almost like the dating service matching system <laughs> where the person posts their profile. This is who I am as a provider. This is what I do. These mm -hmm. are my strengths. This is um, where I live, you know, with not specifically, you know, um, confidential mm -hmm. information, but within the vicinity of where you live. Mm -hmm. And then actually there's also a feature on there where families can post a position that they, they want filled so that they can say this is what I'm looking for. Oh, and we, we were just looking the other day, it really ranges from someone who says I need a live-in person mm -hmm. to someone who says I need someone Tuesday and Wednesday afternoon from 3 to 5. Yep. So it's very, very broad. So that's a really good resource at least yeah. to help find the person right. that you may be looking for. Well, that's great. Now, what types of respite care do you, can you find in Massachusetts outside of the PCAs? I mean, right. is there uh, people that live in, people that can come, you know, from other places. Um, can you fill me in a little bit mm -hmm. about that? I think there's a, a wide range, all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, a lot, there aren't a lot of respite facilities or homes. Um, there are some, now, I think but not a lot. Now that seems to be a problem yes um, because more a, a lot of people I know myself specific, specifically when uh, my two daughters um, I was needing respite care for my two daughters it was it would have been much easier for me to take them somewhere mm -hmm. than for them to come into my home um, and the only reason why is because there are so many things that I needed to do at home mm -hmm. that I couldn't have them there plus be doing stuff because they'd be right. coming to me instead of the respite care provider. Mm -hmm. So I can see people needing yeah. both, but... There, there are some, and actually one of the things that we are planning to do um, and have available on our site is to try to get a more updated listing of the services that are currently mm -hmm. out there. So mm -hmm. we have a survey that we're um, going to be sending out to providers so that we have more updated information. But that's not really answering the question you just asked me. <laughs> so, um, so there are some, huh. as I was starting to say, there are some respite homes. Yes. Um, some of them are um, paid for on a private pay basis. A family would pay directly or if a family received some funding from an agency that they're eligible for, they might be able to use some of that funding to pay through I a see. stipend. Um, but there also are a lot of situations where um, a family would work with, would identify a staff person that would come into their home, as mm -hmm. you said. Or there are also situations where somebody, your, your child or loved one might go to the respite provider's home, not necessarily overnight, but for right. some time. Right. So there's a range. And we're also really looking to expand on potential pools of future respite providers, and one being the volunteer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, nationally, this has been a big push. Also in other states, um, and especially in the South, faith-based groups, churches, synagogues, um, community churches that are already maybe taking care of someone in their in their faith community that has a disability and mm -hmm. they're helping out a little bit um, and a lot of the respite coalitions are trying to reach out to those groups to maybe do some trainings and support and say well are there other people you might be interested in helping out as well so we're really trying to see in Massachusetts how we can tap into that pool of people um, in addition I worked on another project um, which was called the Central Mass Respite Project, which now we've transitioned to the, the Respite Project. And what is this the matching that we've been doing on a very limited basis with college student interns needing to do oh, a practicum. Yes, I read something about that. And, mm -hmm. the, and we match them with a family that needs respite. So mm -hmm. the student's doing 
80 to 120 hours during the semester free of charge to that family. Um, the family, and we, we match them with families that are available to be doing some mentoring, some teaching to support the student as well, but that's been a wildly successful program, so we're hoping to expand that, and we have some funding through a sustainability grant that we just now got. How would you get access that program? Right now it's on a very limited basis because we're networking to some new colleges um, that are uh, interested in getting us the interns, and then um, we're, we would be putting out uh, probably a, a mailing or maybe contacting some of the family support centers that we know of in the region that have families they're already working with. So we know the families are out there, whether they're right. children with disabilities, adults with disabilities. Right. The, the need is tremendous. It is mm -hmm. very tremendous. Now, do all respite care workers have to register with the state? I'm just curious. That's a really interesting question, and actually, the short answer is no. Um, right. The long answer is I think it varies by the agency and the population. Right. Um, within the Department of Developmental Services, which is the agency that I work for full time, um, mm -hmm. and as many of your viewers may know, it's the agency that serves kids and adults with intellectual disabilities. Correct. We actually have a committee right now that's working on trying to pull together some information from some of our providers on the types of training curriculum that they mm -hmm. use because there is a lot of variability. Yes. And I think going forward, I don't know for sure, but I think it's likely that we might try to have that a little bit more, not necessarily standardized, but a little more coordinated. And that's again something that would be available on our website. We have some information already on our website about training resources. Right. Now, um, does, do, I mean, do uh, respite care workers have to all more or less go through a training? Um, or is that variable too? I think ideally we'd like to say yes, but that's not the case. There is no formal requirement. Often, as Amy said, some of the agencies have their own training that they'll do for the respite workers that, they're, that are employees of theirs. Right. Um, we also have found um, that many families, if they sometimes even have outside funding, use a person that they know, another family member, right. the grandmother, the aunt, the neighbor. Um, often, sometimes older siblings might be the uh, respite worker for a younger sibling. So family members tend to use people they already know. So they're kind of comfortable with not having someone go through a formal training in many cases. Right. Um, and, but we're, that's one of the things we're looking at. I mean, really, we have so many initiatives that we're trying to, <laughs> to address <laughs> with, with very little money and very little time. Yeah, and very, and very little, little staff, time. And but that's yeah. one of them, looking at training, right. um, mm -hmm. looking at PR, looking at outreach, looking at resources and information mm -hmm. and support. And um, it's, the need is just tremendous right. uh, across, the, across the board. And just one thing to add to that is, as part of our coalition, we have a, we have great support from the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, which mm -hmm. is the state agency that oversees most of the human service agencies that serve all different populations. So some of the senior leadership at that agency is very involved and very supportive of our program, and they are looking at training too. So I think everything is starting to come together and. Um, there's going to be more coordination across agencies around issues like training. So Yeah, because I would be worried hiring somebody that yes. didn't have any training. I mean, because right. I didn't have any family support right. or anything like that. And I know a lot of parents out there don't have the supports. Mm -hmm. They don't, there's not that nuclear family anymore. Right. Um, so it makes it difficult. And also, family members um, don't want to get involved, mm -hmm. you know, so I think there's more of a call for respite now than there ever has been. Yeah. And I, th I think some families, too, feel like they don't want to burn out their family right. members, so you use them when you really need somebody. Need something. Um, but then if, like, you want to go to a movie, well, I, I might have to ask them tomorrow yeah. if I, you know, if I have a doctor's appointment, so I'm not going to ask them so I can go to a movie. So. They, they get that sort of feeling that they don't want to burn their people out or they're not paying them and then they feel guilty. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole, it's a pretty loaded issue when you're using family members as well. Yes, it's very, mm -hmm. it's very loaded and that's the reason why I think respite is so important um, to, es to establish more respite. Um, and you are addressing this issue mm -hmm. and that's 
good because I think parents really need it. Um, are there any um, age limits or disabilities which are not handled by any respite care providers? That's another great question. <laughs> we, so, did a, we did yeah. a needs assessment uh, a couple of years ago now yeah. that we have the data gathered. We're still sort of formulating a report that we hope to have finished soon. There are a lot of gaps. There are a lot of un there's a lot of unmet need out there. Even people who have services from an agency that they might have some respite hours, it's never enough. Um, ideally, right. if you do have respite hours, it might be like five hours a week, or you mm -hmm. know, ten. Or hours sometimes a, week. Like a month yeah, in some month. cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, so there's never enough. And the ideal, like if you really look up the definition of respite, it's supposed to be like a regularly scheduled right. ongoing break so that you as a caregiver can recharge and you know re regenerate and um, go back to your caregiving duties and that's I mean that's great that we have that ideal I, I really am a firm believer is you aim high <laughs> otherwise you're never going to get there if you aim yeah, mediocre you're going to get mediocre so aim definitely. high but that's that doesn't happen for people yeah um, so not enough hours not enough um, money um, and Go ahead. Right. And just to follow up on that, one of the things that we learned when we did this needs assessment, as Joan said a couple of years ago, is there are definitely some groups of people um, in nationally and in Massachusetts that really fall between the cracks and aren't even eligible. Can you specifically yes. name them? So one of the ones I mean, that we learned a lot about, we hadn't known about a lot about before are people with adult onset disabilities like multiple sclerosis or ALS. Mm. Um, traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury. Although traumatic brain injury, I think that's starting to change a little bit because there have been a couple of um, federal, there have been a couple of lawsuits that have provided some funding and there's yeah. going to be more supports. But even, but still, those are groups that really, there isn't an an agency, a state agency or a federal Our agency that really agency. covers them, or people with um, who develop Alzheimer's at a young age, early mm -hmm. onset Alzheimer's. So there's definitely pockets of um, groups of people. And what about the younger children? Is younger the, children they seem to have more coverage. I think with younger children, and I'm sure many of your viewers are all too familiar with this. It's such a um, a maze of different sources of support and I'm mm -hmm. sure you know parents I know because I've you know I work with parents of young kids who are eligible for DDS and Jones worked in this field too families are always juggling you know what can I get through the school what can I get through my health insurance you know right. piecing things together right. um, I think it's a little bit better than it was um, a few years ago because there's more sources of home-based services, but I still feel like respite is the thing that's always kind of, you know, if there's ever a budget cut, that's the first thing to that's be cut. Thing. It's kind of seen as maybe not a luxury, but not necessary, you know, um, which is not, which so is so not the case. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the, our real focuses as a coalition is to look at those underserved mm -hmm. and unserved groups and try to level the playing field a little bit. And, and just to even be more specific, it seems that if you're over 22 and under 60, you're not really with a group. You're not with the child with a disability and you're not old enough to be in elder, in elder services yet. And then also um, some of the um, medically complex families also have unmet need because their, their medical costs are so high, um, it's difficult to get um, pay everything out of pocket and, and to get any kind of support and services for them. Right. Now, what other agencies are out there as far as uh, dealing with uh, the financial burden of uh, respite care? What, is there any other agencies besides like DDS or? Yeah, well, I think that D DDS, Department of Mental Health, DMH, mm -hmm. um, the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. Um, there's a lot of agencies like that. There's also agencies like the Alzheimer's Association mm -hmm. or the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, which are nonprofits. They're not state agencies, but all of those agencies potentially have some funding that might be available to families. As Joan said earlier, it's never enough. No. Um, but there are, I think, pockets sort of all over the place of little bits of money, mm -hmm. more in some cases, like at 
for, at DDS, my mm -hmm. agency, we've been fortunate the last couple of years that we've started to get a little more funding. We still haven't gotten back to where we were before the big budget crisis a few right. years ago. Right. Um, but it's there are a lot of sources, and again, uh, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, our goal really would be that with through our website, we might w we'd be able to help to point people in the right okay. direction. That's what I was just going to ask yeah. if, the, if that if you had something on your website that could direct people, and that's um, I think that's the key. Yeah. Um, now. The only other question that I have, uh, which we really haven't touched on, is is there any emergency respite care available when something like a death or illness in the family happens or some mm -hmm. emergency happens and they have to get respite like mm -hmm. within a day or two? Because I know um, most places have a waiting list, as, as we had discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. So is there any emergency mm -hmm. care? That's one of our big unmet need areas, emergency care, that, that there is not much out there. I don't know if you know of anything specific, but that people ask about that. We've heard when we were doing our needs assessment, we did some key informant interviews and, and talked to a fam couple of family focus groups. And the stories that you hear from people like, my husband had a seizure and I couldn't, we called the ambulance, but I couldn't go because I had a child that I was caring for that I couldn't take to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, things that are really heartbreaking to hear what people yeah. And so the need, again, is huge. We've talked a little bit with looking at registries and getting staff on board that um, it would certainly involve pre-screening people mm -hmm. and having finding people that would say, oh, yeah, I'll be on call to be an emergency respite person. Mm -hmm. So it's really a daunting task mm -hmm. to, to delve into, but it's certainly one that's on our radar, and it's yeah, certainly Yeah, so it needed. seems like there's a lot of work that has to be done there still. Is. Right. I do want to just um, add to what Joan just said that, again, it really does depend on if you happen to be connected to one of the agencies, one of the state agencies. So, um, most likely, if you're eligible for DDS, um, if it's a, if it's really an emergency situation, families should really just don't hesitate to call your area office, and they will even with their a waiting list. If there's a real critical emergency, they'll make every effort to help, mm -hmm. and. Um, I should also say, you know, p family should feel free to contact our website either via email or, you know, reach out to us and we can try to at least point people in the right direction. Okay. Um, so. Well, thank you very much, both of you. It's been a very interesting conversation. Um, anyway, thank you for joining us today. And remember, respite care should be thought of as a necessity and should be scheduled at regular intervals if you can. So see you next time on You're Not Alone, Surviving Your Child's Disability.